Hello everybody, and this week we'll be talking about specifically the Sierra Nevada bioregion and um, its importance, its uniqueness, and the idea of why should we talk about this specific region in terms of uh, wildland fire ecology in California. So let me move myself over here. There we go. So let's start off with just the description. So what area are we talking about? So we're talking about a huge area. We're talking about just in terms of a distance, 435 miles. In terms of area, we're talking about 26,000 miles, square miles, or roughly 17% of the state. Um, we're talking about foothills and a huge mountain range that extends from the southern Cascade Mountains to the north down to the Tehachapi Mountains and then the Mojave Desert in the south. Um, the big things that people think about when they think about the Sierra Nevadas or the um, significant things that they think about, uh, Lake Tahoe, Yosemite National Park, Sequoia Kings National Park, Mount Whitney. These are some of the, the bigger things that, think, that people think about. What I think about is that um, this area is extremely unique to California. It's, um, it has um, an area of mixed conifer that we'll talk about later that you cannot find anywhere in the world. And so what do I mean by that? It, I mean that most places you have a Douglas fir forest or you have a lodgepole pine forest or you have a ponderosa pine forest. But here in the, in the Sierra Nevadas, because of the uniqueness of the area in terms of topography and weather and climate and all of that mixed together, you have an area where you get all sorts of different coniferous trees, pine trees, trees with cones, all living in the same place. So you can have a forest that will have ponderosa pine and jeffrey pine and sugar pine and douglas fir and mountain hemlock and um, California red fir and giant sequoia and all of these things all mixed together. That's not common. That doesn't happen in a lot of other places. A lot of other places you just get the one dominant species or two dominant species and that's it. But here in this amazing region, you get all of it mixed together. And it's just, it's really special. Um, and it's a special place to, for us down here in Kern, right here, we're just on the edge of it. We get to see, we get to experience part of it. Um, but there's a lot of interesting parts to it. So just in terms of the idea of these amazing things, so this is on the left here is um, tunnel view of Yosemite during the winter and uh, looking at, uh, at El Cap um, and just the idea of just the, the beauty of the national park. And then on the right, the giant sequoias in Sequoia Kings National Park, which are just, it's, it's the, you know, the largest organism on the planet. And it's just amazing that we are able to experience this place um, whenever we want. So a little, a uh, little more physical geography and what what to kind of expect. So um, the elevation ranges from just under 500 feet to over 14,505 feet at Mount Whitney. Mount Whitney is the highest peak in all of the Sierras. And remember, we're basically talking about this whole area right here. Mount Whitney is the highest peak. Uh, on the west side, so going up from the Central Valley into the foothills and then into the Sierra Nevada mountains, we got a nice moderately inclined western side. However, on the east side of the Sierras, this back side here, it's a steep, um, a steep escarpment is the way that they describe it, or basically just it's a drop off. You don't really have foothills on the east side. You just have, you know, like mountains and then we're down to, <laughs> to, to valleys basically. Now, of course, that's a, that's an overstatement. There's areas where it will be a little bit more moderate, but in terms of the west side where you go valley to, to foothills to, to, you know, smaller mountains to, to bigger mountains, it, that's the way it looks on the west, but on the east side, it's completely different. Um, but that's, that's part of what makes, um, the Sierra Nevada so interesting and so, so unique. Um, 
because there's these huge differences in topography, these differences in the glacial history. So the idea that this was all covered by the sea and as the sea retreats and as these places were, were glaciated and frozen over, the way that they, um, the time, different time periods in which they, they, um, receded and um, and gave way and and had some areas had water and some areas didn't leads to this highly heterogeneous so very vastly different patchwork of vegetation fuels and natural barriers you also have this idea of um, uh, in terms of geology more more volcanic uh, rock up here in the northeast whereas what we're used to seeing down here um, which is a, definitely a big, huge feature of Yosemite and other places is um, granitic, granite, lots of granite uh, as our as our bedrock underneath our soils, and in some places just coming up, protruding out through the ground. Um, in terms of the the physical geography at the lower elevations, which we're going to get on the west side, you get foothills and you get kind of narrow valleys. The mid elevations, you get more deep canyons and broad ridges. And then the high elevations, you get rugged mountain terrain, um, which those are very different. And if you've been hiking in the Sierras, you know the difference between hiking on the foothills, hiking at those mid elevations where it's it, things start getting steeper and rougher. And then the idea of the, the rugged mountain terrain, uh, my brother telling me about having to cross a a shale field out in uh, the wilderness when he was hiking um, last summer. That's that's uh, that is what I would definitely describe as rugged mountain terrain. And so, just some more pictures of just all the different um, interesting um, things that the uh, Sierra Nevadas offer in terms of just beauty and also just trying to really highlight these differences, right? This exposed granite, um, these places where there's sparse fuels, and then there's places where these, there's dense forest. And then uh, air, during the winter, it gets really snow covered, and we still have areas of, of uh, glaciation um, or these old, basically old, these lakes that are old areas that are still, um, still from when everything was... Um, was covered by water and then you can even see the difference just looking at the difference in the mountains here between these mountains um, the way that these look in these here just lots of differences in topography lots of differences in um, geology differences in um, amounts of water differences in the types of precipitation differences in the density of the forests it's just it's it's a unique area it's a huge area it's it's vastly different from many places on Earth. So how does fire tie in to the Sierra Nevadas and why specifically talk about the Sierra Nevadas? Well, let's just kind of start painting the picture, basically. So let's start with uh, the climate, right? So the, the primary source of precipitation is going to be winter storms. And, and with those winter storms, more than likely we're talking about uh, rain and snow, but we're really talking about snow when it comes to the Sierra Nevadas because more than half of all precipitation falls between January and March. And if we're talking about January and March up in the mountains, we're, we're talking about snow. Um, there's much more precipitation in the north, northern Sierras than there are in the south. And then um, that's also going to, you can kind of see that in the differences in terms of the, the types of forest and the types of trees that are in the north versus in the southern, uh, central and southern Sierras. And then, of course, we have that rain shadow effect on the east side where we don't have a lot of, um, we'll talk about how it's much more sparse vegetation, and that's because um, that steep drop-off that we talked about before, that's really important in creating that rain shadow because we get that pressure building up on the west side, nice and gentle, builds up, gives us all that moisture because it gets high enough and then it's that steep drop off and all we get is that you know warm air pushing down with none of the none of the good uh, rain coming with it and we get that rain shadow effect uh, what's interesting and um, it's one of those variables where you start really thinking that um, this area adapted itself to fire is that there's extremely low relative humidities common in the summer in the Sierras 
Um, and usually this is due to, uh, to, due to this uh, precipitation because we get all of our precipitation in the winter. So by the time summer rolls around, if you got enough precipitation, great. If you didn't get enough precipitation, then you end up with these extremely low RHs because you've got your potential evaporate, evapotranspiration exceeding your supply of water or the water that you got in those winter storms. That's the way the Sierras work. Whatever you get in the winter needs to last you all the way until the next winter. And if it doesn't, then we end up with these really low RHs in the, in the summer, which then to me, in my mind says, all right, so if we're getting if that's the way it's set up, it's basically the the Sierra is saying, "Hey, this is the amount of water you get. If you if it's not good enough, burn up some trees, get rid of some some organisms, some grass, some shrubs, and then it'll be plenty." Um, it's not it's not that simple, but it almost kind of seems like it is with the adaptations that have been done. Uh, lightning is also extremely common in the Sierras. Um, about a third of all the lightning comes between 12 and 4 p.m. in the months of July and August. So, you know, if you say to yourself, oh, well, I don't know that the idea of it having um, only or mo the majority of the precipitation coming in the winter and then ending up with those extremely low RHs in the summer really means that, that it's adapted to fire. Well, then the idea that the fire, the cause of um, a lot of fires, or at least the cause of the natural fires, seems to come at the very worst time for for these um, for this area when it would be the driest and farthest away from its uh, amount of precipitation also seems to just be you know you could say to yourself that's a lucky coincidence or you could say to yourself well that does seem like an adaptation that you know the precipitation happens here and then all the way over here when it's the farthest away from that precipitation that's where you get the most amount of lightning and the most amount of ways that fire can start, also coinciding when you have these low RHs in the summer. Um, and then lightning activity level increases with elevation, which just makes sense because you just have more stuff to hit and it's closer. Lightning doesn't have to travel as far, so it makes more sense that you get more strikes at higher elevation. So in terms of the current fire period, and we've hit on this um, a bunch, but just trying to paint that picture even more. So routine fire suppression is still the rule for the majority of the Sierra Nevadas. And we've got this picture right here on the left of Yosemite in 1889, or right after the fire suppression policies were put into effect. And you can see these big areas of grasslands, and you can see there's trees and that there's much more, um, much, much less trees, much more grass, much more, um, open area and then in 1994 you can see that that grassland area has just disappeared so it's it's interesting because i think for a lot of people because they grow so slow people don't think about this they're like trees trees don't move trees are in the same place trees don't change but look it okay so yeah that tree you know this tree over here is probably this tree over here and that tree didn't move but it sure had some seed or some birds or squirrels or something took some of the seeds and got it and spread it out. And now its buddies live right next door, right? It's kind of like looking at um, urbanization for people, right? You know, you could look at a map and say, oh, well, people in 1899 only lived in these few places. And now in 1994, they live all over the place. It's kind of the same thing where they've they spread out and kind of taken over. And if you say to yourself, well, why did they take over? Well, that's the problem. The thing that stops them from taking over is fire. The thing that um, would have prevented these trees is, and not big, huge stand replacing fire, just low intensity fire, because we'll talk about this um, uh, uh, in a few slides, but it's really just the idea that uh, a lot of this stuff uh, down here in the, uh, in the valley of Yosemite, it's a lot of uh, fur, a lot of stuff where uh, when it's younger, it gets consumed by fire very easily. But uh, if it gets established, then it gets thick bark, then it um, does some self pruning, then it keeps itself around for a while. But that means that we need 
fire or we need some sort of disturbance. We need something. If we if we think that this looks better than this. Now the thing is if you sit here and you go, well, I don't see anything wrong with this, then that's that's fine. But I've always been um uh, just uh amazed by the beauty of the the mosaic that we've always had uh in in California and the idea that it would all just become, you know, a giant um forest basically waiting for a huge stand replacing fire like much of the the western interior western united states is does not uh excite me as much uh so in terms of the fire suppression uh national parks are still uh kind of in the exception because since the 70s they've been doing prescribed burns and having uh wildfire use fires or fires that they basically the let burn fires if they're in areas where it's safe and it's doing um uh, it's ecologically doing some good. Um, there's also these changes. Um, you can't just say it's it's um, due to fire suppression. It's it's fire suppression um, combined with a change of the fire regime, being that uh, you go from frequent fires to infrequent fires, and um, probably go from low intensity to high intensity. And then the idea of also harvesting, because there is uh, not not specifically here in this picture in Yosemite, but in all the other areas that aren't um, protected in the Sierras, lots of harvesting, um, lots of change in um, and harvesting isn't bad necessarily because it's a it's a it's an introduction of a disturbance. But there was a lot of harvesting. Uh, back in the day that wasn't done right. A lot of stuff that we would call high grading, which is the idea of taking all the good stuff and leaving all the all the uh, not so good ones uh, left to grow and the idea of people not having the right um, the right ideas on, on replanting or, and so you get these areas where you get stuff that's not growing or you get too much and, and harvesting in some areas really really changed the vegetation. Um, so nowadays, when fire does occur, as we've seen on the creek fire down here and and a lot of other ones, the the Sequoia Complex, all, uh, all sorts of different fires lately, when fire occurs, much we have a much greater chance of fire severity as compared to history because the forests are overgrown due to this lack of disturbance like we can see in these pictures right here. And there is a uh, extreme need for uh, prescribed fire. I am on the uh, Southern Sierra Prescribed Burn Council, and one of the big things um, that we are advocating for is the idea of trying to get these areas to get back to their historical fire regimes, get away from these idea of big stand replacing fires, um, get people comfortable with the idea of um, let's let's. You know, if we see some smoke today, it's not a big deal. We know the difference between um, a prescribed burn smoke versus the idea that there's a big, huge, raging wildfire coming and getting some of these areas burned out so that we don't have to worry about big, huge stand replacing fires. We can have small, little, uh, frequent fires that the forest needs to be able to get back to this this historical fire regime that really... Uh, works well for this area and would honestly really work well for us in terms of um, you know it's not a big deal to drive past a road where there's a little you know a fire with little two foot flames going on the side of the road but it'd be insane to drive through a road where there's a fire with 150 foot flame links you know that's moving um, you know at a football field a, a minute that doesn't make any sense and so it's we really have to look at what's happening during the current fire period and really try and figure out what can we do to fix this issue. And so um, there's a big, huge problem in the Sierra Nevadas right now in terms of um, conifer mortality. We have millions, 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 millions of dead trees up in the in the Sierra Nevadas. And it's only going to make the stand replacing high fire severity um, problem much, much, much worse. And it's the idea that we've we've gone through this period of fire suppression. We're still really in the period of fire suppression. We've had our times of drought because remember we've said that the way that the Sierras work is it's whatever you get in the 
in the winter is has to last all year and most of the the uh, summers lately the evapotranspiration has been exceeding the water supply add to that climate change with warmer temperatures add to that pathogens and pests especially bark beetles have become a problem because bark beetles basically um, look for distressed trees and they've been finding plenty of distressed trees up in the Sierras to where we've lost um, huge swaths of forest now combine that with our fire issue and it's just a recipe for disaster as we have seen uh, the last couple of years with just raging wildfires and so um, that's that's uh, that's at least the the kind of um, why why are we talking about the Sierras in terms of fire ecology but now let's kind of go into the idea of um, what what are all the different areas and what do they look like in terms of of the Sierra Nevadas and so let me um, just kind of let you know you can uh, pause the video right now click on this link uh, in the notes and then uh, that'll take you to just uh, it has a lot of descriptions of the different species of trees um, that are uh, in the Sierra Nevadas that we'll talk about but there's a lot of different ones growing here and you know this I just I personally think this is just a, a great picture and it's interesting and I, I've uh, I got this uh, off this website where they've actually added in some other things like they've added in the chaparral and the ponderosa pine forest the red fir forest things that we're going to talk about today aspen grows and just i think it's really interesting to see this profile of you know where where these things are and at what elevations and you know going from the central valley here where we got the oak woodlands and then up into the ponderosa pine and incense cedar then we're up to the giant sequoia and and then we get up to the mountain hemlock and the lodgepole pine and then we're way up in the fox uh foxtail pine and the white white bark pine and then we're up to where trees don't even grow anymore and then we work our way back down again and you can see we talked about the idea of uh, of it being a, a steep escarpment right so we got this big gradual um gradual lift here but then here we don't we have high desert so we don't we don't go anywhere near down down as far on the east side and then we also it's just it's just much much steeper of a drop off and so because we got this long side there and then we got that little thing there so much steeper uh, topography much steeper of a, of a drop off and real quick so that gives us that rain shadow effect, right? Builds up, builds up, builds up. Here's our rain right there. And then we get over the top and just dry wind, giving us much more desert, right? Not a lot of trees here and different kinds of trees too on this side. This area though, we'll talk about this, the upper montane and the subalpine kind of similar because of the, the elevation that it's at on both sides. So let's start with the foothills, uh, foothills, shrubland, and woodland. So we're on the west side of the Sierras, working our way up from the Central Valley since, you know, that's where we're at. So we thought that'd be easy way to do it. So in the California foothills, you get hot, dry summers mixed with mild, wet winters. Um, and so you'll find uh, what grows here are plants that can tolerate drought because they're more than likely going to experience some, some drought-like effects. So in the in the foothills you get mostly oaks, uh, so blue and black oaks. You get canyon live oaks as well. Um, in the um, in the uh, uh, canyons, of course, or the uh, the the narrows, uh, you get foothill pines or what some people call gray pines, um, and you get chaparral species. So um, manzanita, chamise, and California lilac, although you don't really hear many people say California lilac, you'll just hear them refer to it by their genus, which is Ceanothus. So you, uh, manzanita, chamise, and Ceanothus, which are three of the most common um, chaparral species. So in terms of an oak woodland, we get long fire season. Uh, it's adapted to frequent low intensity fires. Uh, if we go back, let me just back it up for a second if we go back just 
look at the way this is set up with the with the the oak trees and then basically um, grass rolling hills underneath right the idea that this stuff would all burn off this stuff would stick around that's just kind of typical among species for frequent low intensity uh, fires the other thing or the other reason we really know this area is adapted to this idea of frequent low intensity spires is or fires is because everything has a um, respout ability especially those chaparral species chaparral mm -hmm. species are used to let's uh, top kill everything and then let's uh, just sprout right back the canyon live oaks um, sprout uh, the foothill pines are um, they they can be um, consumed by fire um, I believe when younger but then they develop more um, more uh, adaptation to to fire in terms of thicker bark and all that when they when they get older um, but the 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 oaks and the chaparral all sprout back real quickly so they are they are used to the idea of fire and if you want to pause the video right now there's a video if you're not very comfortable with chaparral um, if you've taken my um, intro to forestry class before you you will have seen this video if you're not comfortable with the idea of chaparral and what we're talking about, click on that video and that'll give you a good idea. In terms of uh, establishment, survival, and abundance of many species, they're enhanced by fire. So this is an area full of uh, fire enhanced species. Um, the other reason we know um, frequent fire uh, in, was um, common in the foothill uh, grasslands areas is because that would prevent the encroachment by chaparral. If this whole area was covered by chaparral, then we would guess, or we wouldn't guess, we would know that there was less frequent fire because that would have given the chaparral time to uh, continue to get established. Whereas the, the grasses, though, have, uh, have stayed in this area because of the idea of frequent fire. Now, the one thing that is changing this whole um, regime, fire regime, in terms of the oak woodlands, uh, especially in terms of the grassland part um, and, and a little bit into the, the shrubland part, is the idea of native species uh, being replaced by, uh, by uh, annual exotic species. And with the native, uh, especially the native perennial grasses, uh, the ones that live for more than a year, they're getting um, they're getting shaded out by uh, by these other exotics that have come in. They're kind of stronger. They're adapted to more different situations, whereas the native grasses kind of need that specific fire regime, need those certain conditions to be able to survive. And so then, if we're losing those now, when a different fire comes around, um, we might get more of the exotics. Uh, we might get. Um, more encroachment by the chaparral, and we, we're, we're steadily losing some of these, these grassland areas. Um, without these grasslands, too, um, another effect, because we just came uh, before the Sierra Nevada, we were talking about fire and animal interactions. We've got lots of wildlife that love these oak woodland areas. you got acorns, nuts, and berries um, from these trees that support over 300 species of wildlife, but if the grasslands um, and the oak trees and these other places uh, get replaced by different other species, uh, we're gonna, it's it's one it's going to be it's poor quality um, forage for the wildlife, and then two, it's going to lead to that idea of are the wildlife going to continue to persist in this area, or are they going to go somewhere else and look for other uh, other options. And so if we haven't seen um, much oak woodland area, it's, it's, an air, it's something that I really like. I like the idea of, of oak woodlands. And why is it a woodland as opposed to a forest? And I think this, this picture down here on the bottom right really paints that picture. That's a forest where you get contiguous stand of trees, whereas you get more towards the woodland when you get this where it's, it's mostly dominated by grass with sparse trees uh, and shrubs uh, mixed mixed around. You can get pockets of it, like right here, this looks pretty thick, but then you also get these areas where it's just spread out. So that's more of a woodland, that's more of what we would consider rangeland as opposed to, to a forest.
slide myself over here. 